You're listening to Radio Eden and uh, welcome to our Saturday night session. Today, not so much music, actually no music at all, but uh, we'll have a talk with uh, one of my guests who is Trey Smith. Now, Trey Smith has done a lot of work on books and um, um, books of the antiquity. And in specific, he has had a look at uh, one book, which is a book of Enoch. Now, the book of Enoch is a fascinating piece of work. It's been mentioned in the book of Jude in the Bible, but uh, obviously is not part of the Bible. Uh, nevertheless, it's an it's an interesting read, and it, uh, it's interesting to look a little bit into it and to get uh, get an idea of what uh, the book is all about and what Enoch is talking about. So, uh, in the following hour, we'll both be looking at the book, and uh, we've both read it, and. Uh, Trey has done an, a lot of work on the book, so it's uh, he's a source of knowledge as far as the book is concerned. So stay tuned here at Ready Eden. Last week we started off with our first talk, and you can uh, listen to the talk on our YouTube channel, which you can find at www.radioeden.tv. So uh, if you would like to, to listen to the talk again, to this talk, which is coming up, or... Um, to last week's talk, uh, just go to our YouTube channel and uh, give it a go and listen to it again. Uh, over to you, Trey. Uh, Trey, welcome to Ready Eden. And uh, last week we were talking about the Book of Enoch, and we said that this week we were we were looking in, in one particular aspect of the Book of Enoch, which is the the so-called Nephilim. Uh, they are mentioned in Genesis six, just a couple of verses. And um, what are the Nephilim all about? You know, what is Genesis 6 talking about? Well, buckle your seatbelts on this particular show, because when we're talking about the Book of Enoch or any of these ancient cultures that we're fixing mm -hmm. to talk about, you are stepping directly into Pandora's box and taking a look through the looking glass darkly. I couldn't think of any more appropriate way to start the topic of this conversation than to quote Albert Einstein, who said, those of us who believe in physics understand that reality is nothing more than a stubbornly persistent illusion. And mm -hmm. I quote that line because to understand Enoch or to understand what the Sumerians are telling you or to understand what the very most ancient texts written mm. on stone walls in Egypt are saying you have to view reality dimensionally because that's what they're talking about when they talk about the underworld or when they talk about hell or Sheol or TARDIS mm. or the heavens above. They're talking about us being in a plane of, of existence that is separated from these things but is in some sense running simultaneous to them. Uh, making one more quote of mm. Max Planck, the actual father of quantum physics itself, the very fabric nature of reality. He said, in consideration of the smallest particles, I am left with but one question. What is the intelligent mind behind the matrix of all matter? For indeed, none of it is random. Mm. <clears throat> what you, and you're going to find this uh, in any, any, any direction you turn in physics or uh, also in the area mm. of astronomy. You're going to find words, the holographic universe, the, um, you know, the universe is a digital simulation. What mm. they're implying there is looking at the smallest parts, the fabric of this place, um, that reality itself and the particles that make up reality are similar to pixels on your television screen. Mm. And um, uh, uh, in other words, uh, the belief that reality is actually synthetic. Um, I won't go too far down that rabbit trail. It sounds, sounds highly philosophical. Uh, quickly, um, uh, just right. for our listeners who, are, who have just tuned in and didn't listen to the talk last week, the book of Enoch is mentioned in Jude, yeah, which again, and the book of Jude is in the Bible. So that gives it some credence to, to some extent. And you mentioned, uh, I remember you saying last week, uh, that the Ethiopian church actually puts a book of Enoch into their canon of uh, you know, holy books. Is, is this right? Or? 
Absolutely. You are, <clears throat> when you're talking about the, the book of Jude, you're talking about Jesus' half brother. He's quoting, he's actually, he's not just referencing Enoch or a book of Enoch, mm. he's actually quoting from Enoch. He's quoting Enoch 1 9, I, <clears throat> I believe that it is. And when you're talking about the Ethiopian church, what's interesting about the Ethiopians, this is the only culture. Um, uh, well, I mean, this, this is out of all of the cultures in Africa or on the globe. This is actually a Christian nation in Africa. And this is also a culture that uh, believes. And I was very skeptical of this, of, of this at first. Uh, you've probably heard it said that, uh, that the Ethiopians believe they have the Ark of the Covenant or mm. recreation. I don't know what they have, but I believe this. I believe that they believe that they have that Ark, and that's an interesting topic. Mm. It, it also is very, very interesting going hand in hand with that, that they have this very, very interesting book of Enoch included in the canons mm of their Bible. To delve into what Enoch uh, is stating to you, Enoch is a book that would have come over on the boat with Noah. This would be our oldest text. If authentic, this would be the oldest written text we have, and it's giving you a direct glimpse into that world that is being referenced in Genesis 6, where it says, that the sons of God, the Nephilim, uh, came came in and uh, uh, took wives. They saw the daughters of men and that they were fair and took wives. And the implication there uh, might not be even consensual because it's stating they took wives mm -hmm. of those that they, cho they chose um, and, uh, and bore sons unto them. And these were the mighty men of renown. Uh, so, the, uh, the, the, in fact, the, the word Nephilim often gets translated as giants. It does mm. not necessarily mean that every time, but in this, in, the, in this particular case, it does appear that that's happenstantially true, that these children uh, were actually giants. So in the book of Enoch, mm -hmm. what it's doing is it's giving you the full elaboration of what occurred with these fallen angels, what Enoch would have called the Watchers. Mm -hmm. He's stating in his text uh, that in the days of Jared, from the summit of Mount uh, Hermon, that 200 of these beings, these fallen angels, made entrance into this place, mm. this reality. That's what he's stating. So, so basically, I mean, obviously, when we, when we look at angels today, or the, the whole concept from a biblical point of view, we've got the visible world, which we see, which is, you know, flesh and, um, and so on. And what we say is there's a spiritual reality behind it. Yeah, it's basically the reality where God is, where the devil is, where... Uh, where where God's agents are like angels, yeah. Um, so not necessarily little babies with wings flying around, but but powerful, mighty creatures who uh, fight battles. We've got we, last week we talked about the book of Daniel, and um, I think Daniel he um, he had some encounters with with angels as well. And whenever you look in the Bible and an angel comes along, it's it's a pretty fearful event. But uh, one thing it tells us is is they are powerful beings in the invisible world. And it's, it's rare that we get to see them. And, and basically what he is saying is something which was happening is, and this is what Enoch is talking about, that these creatures came into, uh, into our reality and into, into the world we live in. That, that's precisely what he's saying. And he's also, um, well, let me, let me comment on the, uh, mm. uh, that, it, that it's rare that we get to see him. What, what's, what's fascinating to me in, in, uh, the time period that I've been researching this topic, mm. much much of uh, much of the world believes that reality is limited to uh, you know their mortgage payments and their car notes. But when you begin to talk to folks who have been brought up in the occult, when you begin to talk to folks that have dabbled or dare I say delved into the deepest depths mm. of the occult, or conversely, you're looking at researchers who have studied these texts 
over time, not one of these people is anything but a hardcore <laughs> believer. Um, and when talking to folks in the occult, uh, you are going to find redundancies of, uh, of accounts uh, with, with all sorts of things that yeah. uh, uh, this bleed through of one reality into another. Um, that's what the occult is. You're tampering with the fuzzy lines. V- view reality itself like you've got a knob on your on your television screen, and one channel of that reality has five little bitty senses, right? Mm. And you turn the knob. So you, you, may, you may move the rabbit ears on top of your television a little bit, and you can see that there's something in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it looks intelligent, but you really can't make out what it is. And um, uh, that, that these realities are running simultaneous to each other. That's mm. what the occult is, and you're uh, communicating. Yeah, okay, just, just to stop you there, it's, it's, I think it's a good example of what you're saying is... Um, and, and people very often say, you know, how do I hear the voice of God and how do I... Because God is a spiritual reality uh, f- yes. for us. And, and the analogy which is often used is it's a bit like a radio. You, know, you need to, to tune in to the right radio station. You need to tune in to God with your... Um, I mean, I would refer back to the first commandment with, with everything you are, with your whole being, with your mind, your soul, your, uh, your everything. And, um, and then open yourself up to God to, to, to talk to you. And I think the issue we have is, what do we open our, ourselves up to? And very often, um, I think as humans, uh, we can open ourselves up to the other side as well, and that the other side can, can try and get hold of us, and uh, the, the underworld, so to say, can get hold of us and, and deal with us. And this is what's happening in the, I think, if I understand you right, what's happening with the occult, that people open themselves up to, to bad realities, to bad powers, uh, in the spiritual, invisible world, and, and become uh, entangled in it. And, and yeah, yeah. The, fa- the fascinating thing about the occult is that these things and that other reality, they are screaming for somebody to talk to. Yeah. yeah. So with the, the occult, you know, I, I have not found one case yet where you're talking to somebody who has dabbled with the occult that the occult does not produce results for them. And that's not an encouragement to go out and try it. What I'm specifically stating is, is that it's as close as you want it to be. Mm. What Enoch is telling you is that that fuzzy reality where you see those little stations on the rabbit ears but you can't make it out, that there are things in there that can step right through into this reality. And that's what he's telling you occurred in the book of Enoch. Mm. And that these things, he's <clears throat> and he's giving you a specific number of them. He is saying uh, that in that particular that in that case you had 200 of these beings that came in and they made what amounts to a carnival out of mankind. That's literally what you're reading, Mm. that these things taught mankind all sorts of things, wars, violence. They're getting mankind, uh, uh, you know, from the way that I perceive the text, they're getting mankind to do battle with each other, to fight, and to perform all sorts of atrocities. Meanwhile, they're birthing their own children into this place. They're basically taking Mm. ownership of this place. So this is the problem that Enoch is facing and what has occurred to this place made by God himself, Mm. the intelligent mind behind all the the matrix of all matter, as Max Planck would have put it. The problem that the creator is now looking dead in the eye of is that his creation has now been tampered by things that are already at odds with him. Mm. Okay, but... but that's a really interesting point. I mean, the Genesis record, you know, talks about two lines. You've got uh, the line of uh, Cain, and then you've got the line of Seth. Yeah, the good line and the bad line, bloodline. And the the bad bloodline, you've got uh, people like Nimrod, who was a great warrior, which indicates or which which seems to suggest that uh, that there was a lot of war and battles going on in this line. And then you've got the line of Seth, where you've got people like Enoch yeah, and, and Noah, who were the result of it, and they were just people loving and fearing God. Um, I want to take it one step further. I want to look at um, today's reality as well. Uh, you were just saying that, that, that people make a choice, and, and they mix. In those days, they were aligning themselves with evil, or the, you know, the bad spiritual reality which was there. 
it became very tangible to the people. And this is what I think what the Bible suggests and what the Book of Enoch suggests that suddenly, it's absolutely tangible to them. yes, that, that suddenly uh, this these guys that were there, you know, they were just evil guys teaching them into more evil ways. Um, and um, and and if you draw the parallel to today as well, I mean, you've you've had in history very evil people who managed to uh, to have millions kill kill themselves or kill you know kill one another. Um, I'm just mentioning Hitler and Stalin as as one example where you think how was this possible? How could these guys, two guys in history, cause a death of um, um, I'm not quite sure, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty, maybe a hundred million people if you if you count all the fatalities, and there was just tremendous figures which are unimaginable. Yeah. And and it, when you whittle it down, it's just like a a bunch of guys, you know, have done this. So uh, something there uh, about the. Uh, yeah, we've got the book of Enoch, and we've got you know all the stuff Enoch tells us. He zooms into this Genesis account. You know, the the Nephilim, the the sons of God, came onto the earth. They took women, impregnated them. You know, some some great some strange creatures were born, and uh, and you had these. Uh, I mean, when I look here in, in the NIV, it says uh, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. Yeah. Um, yeah I'd like to point. Uh, I'd like out two things there. Number one, when dealing with uh, uh, with Hitler, there, there are actually a great deal of records where Hitler uh, had, had, had physically said with his lips that there was a, uh, a fallen angel that would torment him in the night, and this would mm. cause him terrors and sweats, and, uh, uh, and, you know, and he thought the thing was controlling him. Now, what Enoch is telling you is that these half man, half human things that were created, whether one mm. were to believe that these were a uh, you know some kind of a genetic thing that was made, or if you were to believe that uh, when they took wives, that they were actually literally birthing children in the standard way we would think about it. Either way, they're birthing some kind of anomaly that's you know half angel, half human. Mm. And uh, and when these things die, what Enoch is telling you is that these are the evil spirits. They roam the earth. They have horrible looking faces, and they're in their own mm. they're 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 in their own negative of reality. Uh, view it like this in its description: that you've got uh, like a photograph. You've got the photo, and then you've got the negative of the photo. Mm. And from their their position. In reality, these things are looking for a host. Mm. So throughout the text that will come later, whether you're dealing with the remainder of the, uh, of the biblical text from the Old Testament as far as revelations in the New, or mm. if you're dealing with the Sumerian text or the Egyptian text, or many other cultures around the globe, the idea of something coming in that is looking for a host, a little, little angel on one shoulder and the little devil on the other the little voice that is mm. wanting to systematically control the mind that's what Enoch is telling you is the inception of that very problem in and of itself that you've got things that are in some negative uh, of reality and they are physically looking for something that they can attach themselves to they want control of a body and they mm. do this by pushy pushy little thoughts Little, little pushy thoughts that they're pushing the human into stuff with the ultimate objective of, uh, you know, completely controlling a human. In, in the case of the human not even having knowledge that it's occurring, they think that mm -hmm. the voice of a demon is their own internal thoughts. That is what Enoch is telling you has occurred. And that this problem of these hybrid things that were birthed, that this became so prevalent on the face of the planet Earth... Mm -hmm. You're not talking about something according to Enoch, according to Genesis, or according to later texts that happened in some little isolated corner. You are talking about the entire earth. That's why it required a global flood to do away with what amounts to a severe gene pool problem. Mm. The, 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 the things that were birthed, these giants, are recorded as, as they got larger, beginning to view mankind as food. Mm. Right. That's the that that's that's where we're at. And this isn't something that happened for 50 years, according to those texts. 
at the point that Enoch is recording it, you've got a thousand years mm. between the point that Enoch is pinning this to paper and the point that flood would come. That's mm. a lot of breeding little hybrids. And I don't know what he's saying when he means the uh, uh, that this occurred in the days of Jared, but whatever ca- whatever whatever time period that is, it's some time period before Enoch. That's how long. Imagine a thousand years at mm. minimum of this happening. Okay, I mean um, a couple of things. I mean, uh, I, I sort of heard this interpretation as well from from biblical scholars who were not referring to the book of Enoch. When they talk about, you know, what is all this stuff about demons? I mean, obviously, Jesus drove out demons um, many times, so you can't um, just throw it overboard and say, oh, they were just, uh, they had just some mental issues or whatever. But they were real spiritual issues and they were real, um, um, you know, real things dwelling in those people who were stopping the people from doing whatever they wanted to, but were just taking control of their, their bodies and pushing, pushing them in the background. And yes. um, so, I mean, that, that's very important because today, especially in the West, it's always sort of pushed under the carpet and, oh, it can't be, uh, can't be the case and we've got medicine and we control all this stuff. Um, but it's, it's not quite as, as simple as that because Jesus did cast out a lot of demons. Paul did cast out demons. Peter did the same. And so uh, you have to acknowledge, you know, this is what happened. Yeah. And, um, and one of the, the ideas I'd heard or, th- or concepts I've heard was it that... that um, Demons are these these hybrids which were created between angels and and, and humans, and they're with a the flood they were swept away and their their spirits were just roaming around. Jesus talks about spirits roaming around in dark places, looking somewhere, looking for a dwelling place to go to, and and one of those dwelling places would be humans, and they would then try and attack humans, take hold of them and and uh, control them. The good news maybe it's, at this point as well is is very very important that as um, one of the things Jesus has given us is he's given us authority over these forces. And uh, as Christians, if um, you know we are in Christ and, and Jesus has uh, redeemed us, has paid with his blood for us, and, and we've, um, we, are, we are you know children of God by, by virtue of what Jesus has done, we have got authorities over these these forces and we don't need to fear them. That's very important. If we have not done this, if we have not given our lives to Christ, uh, there's a real issue and there's a real danger as well. So uh, we were talking about the occult before. My advice to you is don't mess with that because you might end up with these so-called hybrids, you know, if, if this interpretation is correct, uh, starting to indwell you and taking control of you, you know, which is something you, you certainly don't want. Trey, back to you. It's, it's it's what it what he's describing is a virus that affects mankind, and that's uh, uh, that that's that's what it is. It's something that's mm-hmm. a leech uh, that is looking for something to feed off of, and also according to Enoch, it's something that never should have really been there. Yet according to Enoch, in those pages, what mm-hmm. Enoch is telling you is the same thing that the Bible is telling you that you were born a direct creation of the creator of the entire universe, the Mm. owner of both heaven and earth, and he wanted children. That's why these things, which were the product of God's own, they're the product of God's own enemy, fallen angels that had literally rebelled Mm. against their creator. That's what these things are the product of. And that's why these things hate you. That's why they're desperate for a little bitty Mm. audience so that when somebody goes out there and they play with the occult, the strange things, the the more that you invite the thing to come in and you open the little door for it, the more it's thrilled to death to have an audience of somebody Mm. to talk to. And that's what it is. That's its nature is a leech. And the nature of what it pushes mankind to do is identical today as it was in Enoch's time. The only difference between the two mm. is that Enoch is staring these things physically in the eye mm. until that flood comes along. Now, in Genesis 6, what it's telling you is it's saying there were giants in the land in those days. Now, note this, and also afterwards. It's mm. talking about after the flood. <coughs> How do you how do you yes. reconcile it? Because I mean, my uh, understanding of the flood is that the, the the Nephilim problem and the the problem of the the hybrids 
was resolved with the flood. I mean, they were um, pretty much wiped away from the face of the earth. A couple of things. I mean, you mentioned, I think, last week that um, uh, people found some skeletons of superhumans, you know, people who were like huge sizes and uh, uh, a lot taller than, than anything we know of today. Like, what was it, like nine foot skeletons of people who were humans who were massive, absolutely huge. I believe that it was in Kentucky. You can type it into Google and find out. But these skeletons actually had red hair. They're roughly about a thousand years old, and you're t and that's just here in the U.S. Mm. There are examples of this all over the globe. Now, I, I can't speak to one discovery that has the height of uh, some of these uh, th these creatures that you're reading about in the text. But if you're seeing, even in the modern day, you're seeing examples of skeletons that would be unheard of right now. Mm. Your tallest basketball players are seven foot two, but you're finding collections of skeletons in places like Kentucky. And mind you, these discoveries weren't made yesterday. You're talking about the late 1800s. We've had this stuff for 100 years now, mm. right? That you've got a collection of bones that is eight and nine feet tall, still got red hair on some of the, you know, on some of the uh, mm. remains. Uh, I mean, these are incredibly tall people by today's standards. What those texts are telling you is that you're dealing with beings that are enormous in size. Mm. Um, if you were to judge by the drawings, <sighs> taking a wild guess, you're talking about people, according to the drawings, and looking at the text that would be in the ballpark of 30 feet tall. Mm. And to give you an idea of how big that would be in both girth and height, if you took your tallest basketball player and stacked him on top of himself four times, you're starting to get close mm. to the size of, uh, of these people. I'd like to point out one other point that's stated in the book of Enoch. when In Enoch, when it talks about birthing, these children, it goes directly from that, and they also sinned against the animals, the reptiles, and the birds. Mm. And I have no idea what that passage means, but I know this, that um, there are a lot of drawings from the ancient mm. past of man mixed with animals, uh, of these hybrid human-animal type structures, Mm. And um, uh, so it, it's impossible for me to tell you where, where, where myth separates from reality in that point of it. But, uh, but in the text it is saying that, uh, uh, that it's not just mankind they did this against, but mm. it's going on to tell you uh, that they were mucking around with, uh, with, with the animals as well. Some would conjecture mm. that that might be the product of where you got the dinosaurs. I, I, I can't speak to that. I don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, I find, again, when I, when I sort of read the book of Enoch, there's, to me there's a lot of mystery in it. There are some things which are fairly straightforward to understand, uh, but there are also a lot of things which, which I find that I haven't got a clue what he is on about, yeah, which um, very mysterious, mystic almost, but, but again, you have to bear in mind this. I mean, one thing I always feel it's necessary to point out is that it's a book which is uh, probably the oldest book uh, on earth, if it is authentic, or if you know big parts of it are authentic, it would have been translated many times. Uh, it would have been written whatever people were talking in those days, possibly Aramaic. Um, it would have gone probably from Aramaic to Greek, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to English. And and uh, you know, being bilingual myself, I I know that sometimes a lot of stuff gets lost from uh, in translation from one language to another. So you always have to make a few. Um, um, yeah, concessions with regards to, to to the translations which would have happened over time, I think, which which might obscure some of the stuff Enoch was saying. Um, what else? Um, the fabric of that text is very hmm. coherent to me, and okay. um, yeah. I, I can uh, one one of the first things that. Uh, uh, that Enoch is going to take you mm. through is he's going to take you an, on a walk through through hell. So Enoch really, this book covers mm. a number of things. Number one, it covers that you had fallen angels cause problems here on the earth, and this would mm. produce hybrids and would also produce what we now call evil spirits, mm. right? So that's 
what Enoch, and that may not encompass every type or every kind of demon, mm. but at bare minimum, what he's expressing to you is that these things that were produced, when they die, they become your enemy mm. in some kind of negative realm of reality. So that's, mm. the, that's the first thing he's going through. The second thing he's doing is he's taking you on a complete walk through, through history, from mm. his day. In fact, he starts the book of Enoch by saying, this book is not for my generation, but for a remote one, mm. which is for to come when the wicked and the godless are to be removed. Mm. So it's a book stated from the beginning to be for the end. Mm. And he's going to authenticate his book by giving you a complete history that leads eerily all the way through to the end. Mm. That chronology has often been used as the argument against Enoch because it is way too accurate. So I okay. would lay that mm. in your hands and I would suggest that it is uh, at bare minimum of high interest uh, to read uh, that portion of the book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. Now the next thing he's doing is he's taking you on a walkthrough, a guided tour of hell. Mm -hmm. And he's also telling you about the heavenlies, and he's telling you about Jesus Christ. When you're dealing with heaven and hell, whether you're dealing with accounts from people today that had a mm -hmm. life after death experience, or, you de or you're talking to people that have, have had glimpses into these things, you find some correlations, not which uh, should at bare minimum mm. be worthy of our consideration. Because yeah, okay. when you find someone whose account of hell today, right, and you're pretty certain they have not read the book of Enoch, right, and mm. what their account sounds like is other people's accounts of hell, which also happenstantially match up with what Enoch is telling you about hell. Okay. It's worthy of... Our, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanted to sort of confirm this. If, you, um, if you've got some time for our listeners as well, just, just try and check it out. You know, go on YouTube and, and there are tons of reports of people who have got near-death experiences and, and some about near-death experience go right into hell and others go into heaven. And, and what I find interesting as well is I find um, that, first of all, a lot of uh, near-death experiences uh, where people have been dead for quite some time uh, and they end up in hell, that, that they are very similar. But there are also some variations. You know? And it always bamboozled me and I thought, you know, what is, what is the truth? Is this the truth? Is that the truth? Is it just a, a vision? Is it just imagination people have? Or is it real, real experience? But when you read the book of Enoch, it's quite interesting as well, because he describes that hell is it's not one conformed place, but that there are different aspects to hell. And when you look at those different aspects, what Enoch describes, it again fits in with these reports. So basically people, from the way I reconcile it to today, is people have had an experience which to them was extremely real, more real, what they report, than, than life here on earth. In, in their body, but uh, that the, they've probably seen different parts of hell and different parts of uh, whatever is going on there in the in the underworld. Um, the same thing with heaven as well. I mean, that's quite interesting when you look at the other side, and Enoch reports about it. You've got uh, you've got uh, witnesses of people who have uh, seen paradise, yeah, whatever you want to call it, who have seen heaven, and um, and have seen it as, as a place. And then to to just go one step back. The Bible gives us a glimpse as well, because Jesus talks about uh, um, um, poor Lazarus and the rich man. You know, one goes to heaven, one goes to hell, and and the experience of both of them is is described. One was comforted, and the other one was in total and utter agony. And and um, and again, what people who have been to this place, what they describe, always fits in with with whatever you know the story Jesus used in his. Uh, in, parable which which i'm sure is not just a parable but it's it's a story of something real which has happened and he was just just talking about it there are at least three different levels to hell according mm. to to my reading of enoch i mean there may okay. be more than this but but in in in, in my reading there, and there are two of them that are that are um, uh, a very very uh, much interest to me mm. when when enoch is pointing out where mankind goes these are in well Hell itself, view hell itself like a, um, uh, like a scorched version of the earth. Mm. That you're dealing with a very diminished 
conversion. And this is identical to what the Sumerians were drawing, and this is mm. identical to what the, uh, the Egyptians were drawing, that you're dealing with, imagine the earth millions of years from now, where it's so decayed that you've got to dig your way to the core just to get heat, mm. and you've got horrible little critters running all over the, the surface of it. But these little critters are not... Um, uh, they're not just little monsters. These are highly intelligent beings. And so are the Nephilim that, mm -hmm. you, that you're dealing with. But inside hell, you've got little catacombs where mankind somehow gets sorted out, right? And they stick you in hell by every account, whether it be from Enoch or whether it be people that have had life after death experiences. Hell is described by these folks as more real than this place that the senses are heightened in that place mm. right so you are put in some kind of a place of confinement another <clears throat> where things are going to come in occasionally and do torturous little things to you here's another detail about mm. hell is that from any account that i've heard from wherever it is that you're stuck by your self you're completely separated right that you can see up, not only in some cases through the earth to the place that you came from, where you wish you could get back to, but even further still is if you can look through the looking glass and see people who are in paradise, which mm. you will never, ever reach to. You are cut off. No one is coming to save you. No one is coming to help. There, If you had one more gasp, of breath within your body, you would give everything, anything in that moment mm. so that you could have one more chance. That is the description of hell, that it is so agonizing in the fact that you, you will never get. You can, you can see where you'd like to be, but you can never be there and you have no access to anything. You are literally cut off. Another, another thing about hell is that it has levels to it. Those angels, those fallen angels, whether you're dealing with the 200 that Enoch is talking about, or whether you're dealing with Lucifer himself, this is not a place that these guys own. I know that because these guys get locked up there. They're in the furthest regions of the place, right? As if somebody feels like they need to be more... <laughs> More, uh, more locked down than an average human being. Mm. They will, they, they uh, uh, so, and that's commonly referred to as Tardis, the place where the angels go, which is the hell beneath hell itself, mm. is what's being described there. Uh, the uh, uh, from Enix, from Enix's account uh, of hell. This is, this is the most sad place that anyone could possibly end up. And it's, and it's right after reading about hell uh, in the book of Enoch that you're going to find him come, come full circle and begin to tell you about the purpose, man, God's plan mm. for mankind to return his sons to himself. And what Enoch is describing you is the same thing that the Bible is describing to you, that God's mechanism of delivery for the Messiah, the Savior of mankind, mm. is the Jews, mm. right? But that God's salvation for mankind cannot be earned. It's a gift. You're born a son. The way that you undo sonship is to reject the Creator. Mm. That's the way that you undo sonship, or to state that what God did to pay for your salvation was not important to you, that it was not something that you care about, or to mock at that. That lands you in the place that many don't even believe exists. But to Enoch, he very much believed it existed. To the ancient Egyptians in every single dynasty, they built the largest structures on the face of the planet Earth, talking about this very place. The place that they said that their gods came from, the underworld, that they're trying to desperately, dearly, 
trying to make atonement with these creatures so that it'll be okay for them in this in this place that's full of full of all sorts of ugly creatures that are going to put you in a pit and they're dearly trying to make deals with these things that's what they're trying to do so while in this day and age you've got uh, kids and people and whatever most of which don't believe that any of this is real at all then you've got those who dabble with the occult and it's sort of play game little stuff Mm. none of those people thought it was a play game they thought it was serious as a heart attack Mm. and what they're describing is that on the other side of this place choice is over Mm. the choice has been consummated in the last moment that your heart beats right that is the moment that the choice part of this is done. And you've either gone on to become a son with an airship of an empire, with more freedoms than you can imagine. One thing that is shared in common about stories of heaven and hell is that people cannot describe to you heaven, no matter how much they try. Even Enoch is dearly trying to describe to you what heaven looks like, but he can't because the only thing we have to relate heaven to is what we know here with mm. our little bitty five senses. It's trying. To, it's, it's like trying to go to the moon on a bicycle. It's impossible, right? Mm. You've got five senses senses for which you're trying to describe infinity Mm. but hell they can describe to you real easy because hell is a diminished place hell has less than the place you're in right in hell you wish you could get back to here Mm. you wish you could get to the worst that it was right here where we sit today it will never get that good again and that's what they're saying that's what kings that ruled empires of earth believed that the place they were going to was worse than this place. Mm. That's what they're all saying. So it's, it's, I think it's important. It's a really important thing. I mean, I look at society today and I think that one of the biggest lies which, uh, which is theirs is that, you know, people believe in God and they believe in this benevolent guy in the sky. And, and, and when you ask them about the devil, you ask them about hell, they just put it off and they say, oh, it's just a medieval invention to, to try and manipulate people. But, but the point is, um, it's real. It's a reality. Jesus, you know, if you accept Jesus and you, you think he was a good man, which sometimes surprises me. People say he was a good man, but they don't want to take the consequence to, to follow his words. They, um, um, they just say, oh, no, no, you got it wrong or whatever. You know? in, in their minds, I don't know how they reconcile it. But again, Jesus made, made it very clear, you know, you've got your choice. You either follow his words, you uh, repent, you turn back from your ways and you turn to God and let God be Lord and Master and Savior in your life. Really Lord, what the term Lord means. Or on the other side, you're just going to carry on the way you live away from God, apart from God. And you're going you're gonna to face your eternal destiny away from God, which, which basically is hell with torment and and like you say um uh, a, a place where you think that even the worst time here on earth was better than whatever whatever it'll be there and and i think it's important to, to to sort of try to get back to this point that salvation means we're getting saved from something and salvation means that um it is safe from from condemnation from eternity away from god from eternity and eternal torment and um, it's very important, I think, to, to point this out. Trey, you, you know two people, personally, who have had a near-death experience. One went to hell and one, you know, stood at the shores of heaven. Uh, can, you, can you comment on those two? Yes, I do, Michael. In the last couple of years of doing uh, the videos that I do uh, on God in a Nutshell, I, I get emails from people all the time and, and talk to people frequently that have a variety of... Mm. Of, uh, uh, of stories uh, about both heaven and hell but there <laughs> there are in fact two people uh, that are very particular in my mind one of them is a gal that had a stroke and about half of her body at least doesn't work right now today even while we talk she died on an operating table so she you know her, her arm and her little leg don't uh, don't 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 work anymore. 
but she's thrilled to death to be alive today, and she is so excited with tears in her eyes to tell you about Jesus Christ, to tell you about Jesus, and here's why. When I sat down and I talked to her the first time, uh, she took me through a place, uh, a place which sounds identical, by the way, to, and I'm very doubtful this gal, this is a very simple woman, I'm very doubtful this gal had read the book of Enoch or had read other things, but she didn't, in fact, die on an operating table. For how long was she dead? Do you, do you know? Did she tell you? I'm not sure, but she was she was clinically dead. Her her father is actually a uh, uh, he he runs he does some kind of administrations. To, he's a doctor himself, but he runs an administration of hospitals in in Texas. So and mm. and, and and she's got a mom that's a nurse. So you're talking about a little girl. Uh, a girl. When I say little, she's uh, 22, 23, something like this. Uh, but you're talking about a gal uh, who was getting the best treatment possible. She, she comes from a family that she's at the front of the line. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, you know, whoever the best people tangible were to work on her, I'm sure that's, that's who they had there. And what her family was being explained to from her mother's account, now, these people go to the, a little, a small church, not mm -hmm. far from where I'm sitting right now, and um, they're sitting out there, and the best people they know on the planet Earth to help save their daughter, explaining to mm. them this is over. And she's inside there, and this is what, what her account was, that she was inside of a place where there were other people that were, that were literally screaming. And this was like a river of, of red flames, but she said it, didn't, it, was, it wasn't like it burned her when she entered these flames. And when she entered this this red liquid stuff that was like a river, that what it was was it was like a crushing pressure, and 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 other people that were in there, and you had a physical body when you mm. were in there, and your your senses were immediately heightened beyond belief. Your feet. This was so surreal that to describe it, this place is not as real according to her as that place. Mm. And they were struggling and screaming to get out and that there were things on the sides that were making sure that you didn't crawl out of whatever this liquid was that was carrying you slowly past this enormous it looked like a stone um uh a, a big stone platform thing now she thought it was the devil she's looking at i'm, I'm not certain of that uh, uh, but there was some kind of a big creature that was sitting there, and it had on top of this uh, uh, this big stone thing that the that the that the red liquid went around the red the river of red flames went around, and he was just sitting on his big uh, stone throne or whatever it's made of, and uh, and he sort of looked like a buffalo in her opinion. Mm. He had uh, uh, you know he wasn't a man. This was some kind of a beast, and it had. It had horns, and it had uh, a bunch of fur on its body, and it had what she believed were in front of it. It had impaled on posts. It had uh, what she thought were world leaders throughout time. She, she said she wasn't sure how she felt that, but as if this thing had trophies to show you right when, it, right when you came in mm. that uh, I've, got, I've got to present to you, and here you are floating past it. What she went on to explain is that the place that water was taking them, just beyond that uh, that creature, that river of flames. She, she's floating with this mass of people that are clawing all over each other, and that's where the, the screams were emanating the largest. And what she said is that she had she felt like she was she had given up. There was a there was there was a a hopelessness that was there, and uh, and a a very large hand, the physical hand, just like the hand that you read in Daniel that came out mm. and wrote on the wall, that a very large hand came in and sort of uh, dusted other things to the side and away from her and somehow got her and, and pulled her right out. And as his hand was coming up, she woke up on that operating table. That was her account. So she's still alive today. Portions of her body don't work, but she is thrilled to death every single day to be breathing. 
the second account and the one that the one that I find the most appropriate and by the way these are not unusual accounts mm. the second account and the one that's more appropriate perhaps to uh, to take this uh, uh, particular talk tonight out is uh, an account of heaven and uh, there, there's a man named Ray that uh, I'll save his last name but this is a guy uh, that I got to not only meet but to spend some time with he's got a cattle ranch uh, that's in Texas and I spent several days out there uh, with this with this man uh, he was dead for a lengthy period of time on uh, on an operating table I don't know how long that was but I mean apparently they, they keep records on people that have been revived you know the longest or whatever and um, uh, so he's not number one, but he's on that list. And what had happened to him is he had a um, he had a heart attack, and uh, uh, he came from a family that very much mm. loved Jesus, and um, and he died, and um, he died on the way to the hospital. And his account was this: that um, he um, uh, found himself in a place where he was surrounded by people. And he said, but they weren't like what you, uh, uh, that they weren't like people here. You could tell that it was a person because you could see them in the same aspects that you see a person here. But it was as if there were more dimensions to them and in examining the place and looking around the place he was in, there were things going on all, all over the place, things moving this way and that. And he said that there were these beings that were moving back and forth very fast. And it took a little bit of time, whatever that may mean in a place like that, for him to adjust where he could, where he could see these things. And he said to one of them, why is it that the things here are moving so fast? And, um, and the reply was, it's not that anything is moving fast. You've just been used to things moving so slow. Mm. The, the place, and, and you could sit there with Ray for 45 minutes with him trying dearly to describe to you even a portion of the place uh, and, and still be confused as to what he's trying to convey because there is nothing for which to relate it to other than his mm. statement to me at one point in saying that it was so beautiful. I was sitting there. I remembered my family. I knew I was dead, and the place I was in was so real that this is not like high-definition television versus black and white. He said there is no difference he says, every day, sitting in this place with these cows, this world that other people think is so important, mm. to me, is like nothing in comparison to that place. This place is void. Mm. He says, I knew that my family would have tears, and I knew that I had just died. Mm. He said, but I did not care. I wanted to be where I was, and mm. I knew that I was in a place beyond imagination, and I wanted to stay there. The people were, were going in. They were going in through some kind of a doorway, and there was a large uh, being. He felt like it was an archangel. He said this being was enormous in comparison to him. Mm. But this being put out its hand and stopped him specifically. And he said that he was, that this was the first point in the entire deal where he was afraid. Mm. What's wrong with me? Why am I not, why can't I, I, I go in? He starts, he starts saying this. And he could see beyond this doorway to a place that was more incredible than where he was standing. Mm. And he wanted to go, he wanted to go in. And, and he says, what, why can't I go in? And it replied to him, I don't know these things. I just do as I am told. And he, he, he said, he, he, he cried out to it. He says, uh, he, he says what, what's, what's wrong with me? What, why, you know, he, he's, he's trying to, to go in. What's, what's wrong with me? And the, and, and, and the being, the angel, says to him, uh, you're not finished yet. Whatever that 
means, whether that means that he needed to talk to somebody on a bike, doesn't matter what it means. You're going back, and it said that the thing took him and put out its hand and pushed him on the chest, and as he fell backwards from that place, he woke up on that operating table after doctors had given up on him. Mm. And so every day that he lives in this place, this is what he told me, is that he's a he is an unwilling hostage in this in this place, and he's awaiting. And and I want and, and, and imagine that wherever you are, this 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 man. I, I spent numerous days with Ray, and uh, and that really is his point of view on this place. Mm. That he is waiting. Most people are scared to death of death. And here's a man that's sitting there, and he can't wait till the day that he gets to walk out of here. Mm. That's the comfort that he sits with, that the place here has absolutely no flavor whatsoever in comparison to what, to what lies ahead. So when you look at the words of Jesus Christ, who is out there, and he's or the words of Enoch, who is telling you about both of these places. Mm. And you're looking at Jesus Christ who is saying, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, Mm. that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God is not against mankind. To the contrary, God in every one of those passages, whether you're reading Enoch, whether you're reading Genesis, every single one of the prophets, save not one or any one of the New Testament writers all the way to the end, God's purpose for mankind is that each and every one of us has an inheritance, a literal kingdom that is beyond what our mind could even conceive. He is not trying to prevent us from get, getting things or to zap us from above or to make us to make us slaves to him. To the contrary, he is birthing sons. And what a son does for his father who owns the kingdom is mm. a son bows up his chest and says, I'm not flirting with my father's enemies, which is what is being stated to you in Enoch, whether you dealing with the Nephilim or the evil spirits or what any ancient culture wants to call any one of these creepy little things that dwell in whatever little dark places that they dwell in, from the hell beneath to the negative side of reality to the voice that whispers in your ear and tells you to do things that you somehow instinctively, God-given, know you shouldn't. Mm. That's exactly what's being flirted with, that you stand for your Father's kingdom. That's what... That's what this means. And these places, in my opinion, are so real that we are so naive. Let me tell you this. No matter how long you're alive for, you will be dead longer. These are the most critical questions that could face any one of us. These are the very same questions that would face any human being if they woke up in a ditch. Who am I? Where did I, where, where did I come from? And what happens next? Yet these are the last three questions that most people will ask through their entire lives. They're caught up with their mortgage payments and this and that and what's what's happening next. Or is the economy going to fall? Is it going to rise? Is this going to happen? Is mm-hmm. that going to happen? Jesus Christ said the, <clears throat> the Lord loves uh, even, even the birds. He knows every single hair on your head. And it is inconceivable. When, when studying even the basic sciences of this little bitty material world that we're in, inside this finite little universe that we're in, it is inconceivable, just as Ray Drake is explaining out there, that he can't even describe to you one little part of those heavens in comparison to this place. And that's how big our Father is. And that's what Jesus is is going on to say redundantly that this is not an inheritance by you're going that a person is going to do a bunch of good works and impress God. There's only one thing that impresses God, and that's that you trust Him and that you say thank you, Father, for what you've done for me. Plato said to Socrates, he said, "I can. <clears throat> uh, I'm not saying that deity could not forgive sins." but I don't understand how such would be possible. 
That was three centuries before Jesus Christ would come. See, Plato understood the problem that a true and just God could not allow, no matter how much he wanted to, a true and just God with integrity could not allow a creation right, that shook their fists in his face and mocked at him and was a contradiction to him, right, to dwell in the same presence as him. What Plato could not have conceived in those hours that he made that statement is that God himself would insert himself as one of us and fulfill every single rule that he himself had made mm. and then offer himself as the payment, right? The payment for it. So when God is looking at you, who he loved so much, no matter who you are, what place on the planet Earth you were born, when he sees you, he's not looking at you. He is seeing his son. And his son died for you. And that's why it is so critical. There is no works on this planet Earth according to any of those pages that can save you, but simply a thank you, which is probably in line. And um, you were chosen from the very beginning. That's what Enoch is saying. That's what all of the writers were saying. And it is my humblest opinion that there is no deal that can be made with demons or underworld gods for which a man can outrun that place that that little girl just down the road from here today, there is no way she could have made a deal with the big ugly things sitting on the podium or the things that are poking at her to keep her in there or the place where the people were screaming that she was barreling towards. So every day of her life, she sits there and says thank you because she wants to go to the same place Ray Drake was, which he can't describe and which Ina couldn't describe either. What I'm telling you is this, is that our God is so great, is so large, is so incredible, and is so overwhelmingly loving that it is beyond description. And to fail, to hit our knees once in a while and say, Lord, thank you for even giving me the breath that I breathe now is the uttermost of arrogance. We've been given a gift that is so beyond belief. And that's what Enoch is saying. And he's telling you the end from the beginning. And he was the one in the text of Genesis who God loved so much that Enoch was not, for God took him. Amazing stuff. I <clears throat> I just want to sort of wind it up here at the, the end of the, the show. Um, we were talking about the book of Enoch. And there's a reality of heaven and hell, which is very real in the book of Enoch. Bearing in mind, Jesus in the New Testament talked a lot about heaven and hell, and as a matter of fact, mentioned hell more often than heaven. So there's a, there's something we have to deal with. Uh, the other point which came out was um, our destiny, unless we come to God, unless we accept what Jesus has done for us, that he has shed his blood for us, and we accept his sacrifice for ourselves, by by coming to God in in a, in a in a sense of repentance, of turning around and accepting, you know, the blood of Christ as forgiveness for our sins, that uh, our eternal destiny is in this river of uh, torment of fire, um, with the underworld with these ugly things, um, and not in heaven with God, because a righteous God can only receive righteous people, and the only way we can become righteous is being made righteous <clears throat> by what Jesus Christ has done for us and by accepting his offering on the cross. Uh, and, the, and the blood he has shed for, for the forgiveness of our sins, which, which I think is a very crucial and you know, very important message to, to come out of this tonight. Um, the book of Enoch zooms in. That's, I think, the way I, I see it a little bit. Some of the things Jesus describes, you know, very concisely, Enoch goes and he zooms into the, uh, the reality of heaven and hell. And, and I think one thing which came out as well is um, hell is probably just, uh, you know, take the earth, make it a million times worse than what it is with all the torment, all the trouble and everything you've got there. 
and you probably hit it, heaven you cannot describe because it's beyond us. And there are no words, you know, to describe the beauty, the tranquility and, and, and the good stuff that's 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 awaiting for those who who uh, have surrendered their life to God. Uh, Jesus is referring to hell that many times, and so are these other writers, because it's that dangerous, in my opinion. I think so, And too. that it's, 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 it's that critical that you understand how real this is, mm. and, uh, and, if, and if you're predisposed, what Enoch is telling you, he's not only telling you about Jesus Christ, he's referring to Jesus Christ in the same way that Jesus would be referred to in the New Testament, mm. as the Son of Man, the uh, the elect one, that through his name they shall be saved. Mm. The uh, and this is this is redundant uh, in, in the in the book of Enoch, and what Jesus is telling you, he's referring to hell very often. Jesus often spoke, in fact, primarily spoke in parables and also mm. in metaphors. So when he's talking about hell, very commonly with Jesus, you'll hear him, he'll use the word Gehenna. Mm -hmm. What Gehenna was, is it was a place outside Jerusalem that they would have all been familiar with, where they burned the trash, mm -hmm. where the things that are unwanted are taken and they're actually incinerated. And so this is the parallel or the metaphor that he is making. In the video that uh, I put out here recently, the theory of everything, I, you know, you're dealing with quantum physics and these other things, and so I, I you know, I, I, I make a parallel that is, you know, on a computer program, right? Every computer you've got has got a trash file, and that trash file is for things that like to attack the system. See, the system is made. You were born. Your design premise is to flourish. The, the only thing that one could do is to actually fight to self-sabotage themselves. Mm. That's how you end up in Gehenna. That's how you end up in the trash file, is by fighting against the very design premise of you having mm. to flourish. It's built right in. Um, but he's also, he's not just talking about hell. And hell is not a, God is not up there with a, uh, with a magnifying glass trying to burn our legs off like ants. God gave his son, he gave his son, so that we could have life. See, we could have been like those Nephilim things. See, those things that hate you, see, they don't have a choice. That's why they're angry. Mm. That's, that's why they're mad. They, they don't have, they were the product of something that was unwanted. They're the product of fallen angels. God said they will take, in the book of Enoch, God says, uh, uh, they will take no pleasure in their sons. The destruction of their sons shall they lament. Mm. That's why these things hate you. These things, misery loves company, and that's, in my opinion, sort of what you're dealing with. You're dealing mm. with things. Uh, when the when the when the uh, when John D, who was one of the head occultists under Queen Elizabeth, when <clears throat> this is what he said. Let me quote okay. an occultist, okay. Queen Queen Elizabeth. Uh, spent enormous portions uh, of funding from the empire on John Dee's practices, as well as another black magician named Edward Kelly. And these were the intelligence men for the empire. This is what John Dee said. He said, if one were to peer into their world through portal of spirit, you could easily perceive it as nothing less than a madness of monsters, insects trying to crawl over each other for merely a breath. Be not deceived, for these things are highly sophisticated, acting out their fantasies through the minds of men. It is by this mechanism that an invisible enemy systematically controls all mankind. I have no option but to recommend that we work with the leadership of these things, for they are already in control of your empire. Mm. And, th and this is, you know, th this is a guy that is doing intense ritual ceremonies on a day-to-day -day basis. Queen Elizabeth is explaining to uh, to the world that John Dee is talking to angels. But, of course, after John Dee died, we have his diary, which 
you're available to read today. There are copies of it that are printed. This is the diary. So in his diary, he's probably not making stuff up, right? Because he didn't mm. intend for anybody to read his diary. But he's not talking about angels. He's meticulously tracking entities. Entities that, mind you, look identical to what people are drawn. Some of the entities that he's describing look identical to what people are describing when they talk about these alien gray things mm. today. And, uh, and another point that I'd like to make is the first drawing of an alien gray that existed in human history was drawn by Aleister Crowley. And he mm. called the thing Lamb. And he said that this was an entity that came forth after days, a drooling days, of some kind of occult ritual that took him. He was thrilled to tell you how much effort that he went through to set up his occult ritual for which this thing uh, presented mm. itself in a physical manifestation, is mm. the way he describes it. And that this thing would be his uh, spiritual guidance till the end of his life. Mm. Uh, and to notate one more issue, when dealing with Enoch, when we're reading those texts and you're reading about things stepping into reality that really shouldn't, we right now live in a day and age where you have not hundreds, not a few crazies, not a few backwoods people, but you have got thousands, if not tens of thousands of people who report uh, just in the alien spectrums, these phenomenon of mm. alien abductions, which is, at bare minimum, a very disturbing facet mm. of psychology. Because what these folks are reporting, if authentic, is that very ugly little creatures, right, are not, not coming from a spaceship up in space somewhere, but are just stepping right out of thin air into their bedrooms. Mm. So, and also, when you're dealing with the things that are in the sky, little mysterious lights and that, the stuff that's not military, the stuff that, that, that pulls tricks that, uh, that, that seem to defy physics, right? The telltale sign of these things is that uh, they just appear and then disappear. Mm. So, uh, to a critical man, the questions might become, number one, where is it when you don't see it? Mm. And if it's coming from another planet then, well, I mean, you would think with all of those reports, and at this point, tens and tens of thousands of videos on YouTube of all sorts of strangeness going on in the skies, if you had men coming from other planets, I guess my question would be, uh, why can't we sense the traffic? Mm. But whether you're dealing with Enoch, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, or ancient cultures all across this little blue rock in space, Every one of these people believed that their gods, these things, these unfriendly little hostile suckers in their, uh, their, their little diminished world, were as close as the air between your fingers when you reach out into empty mm. space. And, uh, and that they're dearly trying to communicate with you on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the reverse of this message in Enoch and throughout mm. the Bible that your father created this place. He wants you to be heir to a kingdom and that you've got to bow your chest and say, no, I'm not listening to the little bitty, all the little bitty things that want their voices heard in my ears, right? But that I'm a representative of a kingdom that is beyond this place and my father owns every single particle mm -hmm. of this place. So those, those are the... Uh, uh, those those are the two diametrically different directions that are being presented, in my opinion, mm. uh, throughout all of the ancient world leading up to this very hour that we talk on this video. Okay. Uh, Trey, uh, we need to wind it up here. Um, where can we find out more about your, uh, your website and, and the stuff you're doing? If you get a chance, visit GodInAnutshell.com. So it's just like it sounds, GodInAnutshell.com. And you'll find a variety of videos there on everything from Enoch to mm. uh, uh, to evolution. One of the more critical videos that uh, that I've got is on um, on the sciences of this place. At bare minimum, um, at bare minimum, uh, arming yourself mm. with knowledge of 
uh, some of the basic things about genetics and programming as well as what we know in, in these hours that we talk right now about quantum physics is powerful knowledge to have. So you might want to check those out if you have time. And uh, I want to thank you for sitting mm. and listening to uh, uh, this dialogue on Enoch. Okay. Trey, thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time out. 